Don Carpenter on News Talk 1270 KIML. News Talk 1270 KIML. Don Carpenter Show. Welcome back to the program. It's 808. And we're pleased to have a very special guest on the line here. And we'll go to him in just a second. Uh, we're going to talk in a second to Ambassador Francis Rooney. He was the uh, United States Ambassador to the Vatican. From 2005 to 2008, he was appointed by President George W. Bush. Currently, he's the chief executive officer of Rooney Holdings, a diversified investment company and Manhattan Construction Group, a civil and building construction company. He's also the author of The Global Vatican, which is a book that kind of describes the role of the modern Vatican in dealing with uh, all of the problems around the world Good morning, France. Uh, Ambassador. Good Ambassador. Good morning. Good morning, Don. It, it's a. Good morning, it, Don. Thank you. It's it's a pleasure to talk to you. I don't know if if uh, if there's a little bit of a delay. I'll kind of uh, I'll kind of cut off after after my uh, after my questions for you. But first off, welcome and thanks for joining us this morning. It's always a a pleasure to have uh, have such esteemed guests on the show. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background first? Well, I've been in a series of international businesses for many years and was a friend of President Bush when he ran for governor and president and had the opportunity to do a few things for him uh, during the first term. And in the second term, he offered me the opportunity to be his ambassador to the Holy See, which I was certainly glad to have the opportunity to do. Okay. So, so uh, you know, as, as the ambassador to the uh, the Holy See, the, the, the Vatican, uh, I imagine you have a, a unique insight on on how the Vatican and, in particular, Pope Francis can kind of uh, help mediate some of these problems that we're seeing around the world, particularly uh, with uh, radical Islam. Well, that's the argument I made in the book, that the Holy, my book that I wrote, The Global Vatican, that the Holy See's soft power is uniquely important in the world of uh, foreign affairs, and especially so now that we're dealing with these religiously either inspired or, or using religious as an excuse types of conflicts in the Middle East, that it, it, we definitely need the, the Pope and the Holy See weighing in and using their, their influence in the world to shape the discussion of how to deal with these problems. And I think that the Holy See has been very effective in raising issues and using its convening power to try to draw out moderate, non-radicalized elements of Islam and try to push the argument that they need to take some responsibility for their religion. Well, and of course, I think most people in the United States are are pretty familiar with Pope Francis at this point. But uh, Pope Benedict was also uh, very, uh, uh, very proactive, wasn't he? Well, he was. I think that uh, you know the first major um, salvo in this 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 response was the original Danish cartoons in two thousand five and six in Denmark, where. Uh, the Pope spoke out, President Bush spoke out, but many countries did not. They kind of cowered when the Muslims started rioting and, and, and expressing violence as, a, as an opposition to a cartoon that showed cannons coming out of Mohammed's head. And then shortly after, you know, in 2006, Pope Benedict gave his Regensburg Address, where he severely criticized the concept of religion being used as an excuse for violence under any circumstances in the modern world, and called strongly on Islam to reform itself, and to come up with a, a method of interpreting the Koran, which is consistent with the way the rest of the world lives. Well, now, now what's the response been like from uh, some of the more secular countries in the Islamic world? Well, the, they've, they've, they've actually, many uh, imams and Islamic thinkers, especially from the more secular countries, have, have come out and spoken of the need to interpret the Koran in light of modernity and, and of the need for interreligious dialogue among all religions and, and decrying the use of violence uh, in the name of religion. Here, even recently, some, some non-secular Arab nations like King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia and the religious minister of Jordan have spoken out to say the same thing against ISIS and Al Qaeda. Well, it, it does seem it does seem to be that we're seeing more and more resistance uh, from the from the more moderate elements in the uh, 
in in the Middle East and the Islamic world, uh, I, I think they're even getting tired of of uh, uh, tired of all the violence being you know being executed in the name of their religion. Yeah, the the level of violence and and harshness has radically increased with the arrival of ISIS and and some of and the, some of the recent insurgent groups like Boko Haram. Uh, they almost make Al Qaeda look quaint sometimes with what's going on right now. And of course, the recent Taliban uh, killing of 146 students in Pakistan. So, with the rise in the brutality and the number increase in the number of people that are being killed. I think the whole world's starting to rise up and look at this as a global issue. You know, President Bush called it the global war on terror, and I think he was right. Well, and and of course, one of the one of the major one of the major problems, and and I've actually had a uh, uh, had a uh, uh, an Orthodox uh, Orthodox priest in, in uh, to talk on the show about the persecution of Christians in especially in Syria. Uh, but I mean that's a that's a major problem. How is the um, how is the Vatican handling that? Well, the, the persecution of Christians has been a has been on a steady rise ever since this whole Arab nationalism radicalism began around the time of the fall of the, of, uh, of the change in government in Iran, and uh, uh, the Pope and the Holy See have, have lit, lit their voice uh, along with Orthodox Christian leaders in opposing the persecution and in, in, in calling on nations to help ease the plight of refugees. But all they can do is speak up, you know, and, and, and use their influence. We've got to, the, 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 to find the solution to all this, we've got to have more people than the Christians speak up. We've got to have the Muslims take control over it, you know, and instead of sitting back and letting Christians in their countries be murdered by uh, these radical cells. And, and and of course, uh, I'd I'd imagine uh, leaders like King Abdullah are are going to be key in in that side of the response. Oh, I think they absolutely will. Both of the King Abdullah, Saudi Arabia and Jordan. You know, Jordan's probably our strongest ally uh, outside of Israel in the Middle East, and we need their help to to use their moderate voices and try to encourage other Muslims to oppose this stuff. Well, and, and uh, of course, Egypt as well. I mean, Egypt, uh, we've seen Egypt standing up uh, against a lot of this violence as well. So uh, there, there is, I guess the bottom line is there is a, a little bit of hope to be seen in, in the situation. But I think we're a long way from uh, any kind of resolution at this point, right? Yeah, it's going to take a lot of pebbles to fill up the pond. But we are seeing a few, a few encouraging uh, instances of people speaking out. You know, we got lucky in Egypt because the, despite the fact that the administration backed a Muslim Brotherhood government, which I could not understand why they did that, uh, we got lucky that uh, the generals came back in and they've, kicked, they've, they've de- depowered the Muslim Brotherhood, and therefore they can provide uh, support to do the thing that you just mentioned, to oppose radicalism, and now they're stepping up to oppose ISIS in Libya. Well, now, now going forward, I mean, what what role do you see uh, Pope Francis and the uh, the Holy See uh, having in in any kind of future uh, future negotiations or or uh, you know future uh, talks with some of these uh, some of these more radical uh, elements? Well, I, I see the Holy See continuing to use its convening power to draw together any elements of Islam that want to meet and, and, and seek to uh, <clears throat> uh, spread understanding of moderate positions and alternative positions to the, to the radical stuff and start to build, build more of a context for, for a non-radicalized Islam in the modern world. I, they're going to continue to push on that, and they're going to continue to, to use their religious nature uh, to speak up in a manner that is different than the way secular nations speak up. But hopefully these voices will add a non-combat, soft power uh, help to the work of troops on the ground, drones, intelligence services, and all the other uh, types of power that are being brought to bear on this. So, so you're not saying that, uh, so you're not saying that there shouldn't be uh, uh, any kind of military response. You're just saying that this should be in addition to that. Yeah, I think we need to apply every lever possibly, every lever of power and influence possible. To, to bring an end to radical Islam and the terrorism that they're perpetrating around the world. So that calls for all kinds of different uh, 
uses of intellectual uh, uh, as well as uh, practical force. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we should have our troops on the ground. I happen to, have, I happen to think that we should be bringing more and more pressure on the people who are in the neighborhood over there and have the most to lose to do the uh, ground fighting, because we, I think we've shown that we have limited capability in those areas. Well, it, it it does seem it, it does seem like the best solution would be uh, for the United States at least to support uh, Jordan and Egypt and other like-minded countries in, in their efforts to root out the radical elements. Yeah, and Turkey and the Kurds. You know, who can fight over there? Jordan can fight. Uh, Abu Dhabi can fly. I don't know if they can fight. Certainly, Turkey can fight anybody. Uh, the the Peshmerga and Kurdistan have shown they can fight. Israel, of course, can fight. So the people that can fight need to fight. And the people that can fly need to fly. And the people that can provide intel and training need to provide intel and training. And I think the diplomats need to be speaking up and, and trying to enthuse moderate Muslims to oppose the radical elements of their own religion. Because ultimately, it's going to have to be Islam that, that reforms itself. Well, it, it certainly uh, it, it certainly hasn't hasn't worked uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to do it the old fashioned way. I think this is a uh, a very uh, a very unique a very unique way, and and, and of course the uh, uh, the uh, Holy See and, and Pope Francis have a, a huge part in that. Yeah, and I think it calls for some new ways of thinking. I mean, we're going to have to really contain the people that are creating the violence. You know, we can't just have these guys like the one that did the Charlie Hebdo killing. Uh, drive, using the Schengen visa, for example, in e the EU, drive to Spain, not go through any customs or immigration people, put his wife on a plane to Syria, and then drive back to France. And during the process of those two drives, the French uh, security forces lost track of him, and they'd been following him. And we have to come up with some better ways to, to contain and interdict. And that may require some different thinking about the Schengen visa and about how many places you can fly to out of some of these countries and how to strengthen borders. Well, and I mean, all you have to do is is just look at uh, the the way uh, the way we look at security in this country. When you fly, I mean, uh, they're more worried about bringing a, a four ounce tube of toothpaste on than where you're going. Yeah, I would rather make sure we know anybody that's coming in or going out of radicalized areas and have time to make sure that they're not part of the problem. Right, and and, uh, and of course. <laughs> And of course, uh, the EU having the open borders like that uh, it makes it a little tough. Well, and there's one other thing is that uh, there was a recent article uh, that shows some statistics from the Pew Research Institute that 85 percent or so of imams in the United States are foreign born, and of these imams in the United States, some 26 percent openly and and publicly criticize the way of life of the United States. Now that's a problem here. Well, yeah, and that, and now, uh, how do you uh, how do you end up balancing that with a uh, you know with uh, with a First Amendment uh, issue then? Well, I don't think you stop them from speaking because of the First Amendment. Absolutely, that's what the First Amendment is all about. But you can perhaps apply some surveillance and um, um, not necessarily confinement, but certainly surveillance and information transfer to make sure we know who these guys are and what they're saying and pay attention to who's being talked to by them. And as soon as somebody that's been in their school, like the Fort Hood bomber, uh, was taught by that imam in Falls Church, who had also uh, uh, talked, uh, taught some of the 9-11 people, uh, maybe when those people start to move around, we watch them a little more closely. Well, and, and that now, and, and it's not like we don't have the uh, ability, the technical ability to keep track of people. We know that that happens all the time. It just doesn't seem like we are following the right people at the right time. Yeah, and it's, it's more difficult, of course, in the United States with the Fourth Amendment. And I'm certainly not, would not argue uh, undermining the Fourth Amendment at all. But, but we, we, we have some threats here that we need to deal with. And Maybe it calls for keeping a little better track on people that have been involved with radical imams, and let's find out if any of them go the wrong way or not. Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, and, and, and you mentioned uh, a lot of these guys are here on visas. I mean, uh, it, it's it, it certainly uh, certainly would be a useful tool to maybe uh, maybe revoke some of the visas of some of the guys that uh, uh, 
uh, have been proven to be a little bit more radical. Well, yeah. Say you've got say this twenty six percent that openly criticize the American way of life. If they're not citizens here, they don't have Fourth Amendment rights. Maybe we just kick them out. Good point. Yeah, it, 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 that's you know just a. I mean, I'm I'm uh, more, the most base of laymen when it comes to this sort of thing. But it seems like that would be a, a possible solution as well. Uh, so uh, we only have a couple minutes left before uh, before I have to wrap up with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about um, a little bit about your book, The Global Vatican. Well, I wrote the book, The Global Vatican, to try to uh, bring some visibility to the important work the Holy See has uh, conducted in the world of foreign affairs and diplomacy for many years, and to make the argument that they're still relevant, and perhaps more relevant now because of these kind of problems we see, uh, than in the past. And we need their diplomatic voice helping solve problems since they're kind of a, uh, since since they're such a like-minded in, uh, sovereign institution as the United States. The other argument I made in the book is that uh, the United States and the Holy See are the only two sovereigns that are founded clearly on the natural rights of man, the social contract of the governed and the governed, you know, that, that the rights don't come from the state. and We are the first people to enshrine religious freedom in our Constitution. So as such, we're natural allies, and we have great opportunities to benefit by working together. And now, uh, and this is completely, uh, completely off, uh, off all of these topics. Uh, but I was, I was going through your bio, and I noticed you had a hundred ton master's license. Uh, what is it that you, uh, what is it that you sail? Uh, well, I've, we've sailed all kinds of boats. We, we've had boats ranging from uh, sixteen feet to one hundred and sixteen feet. And we've had a lot of boats. I used to do a little bit of sailboat racing, and my wife Kathleen and I used to cruise on a 40-foot boat with our kids when they were all babies all over Florida and the Bahamas and, and the Virgin Islands. And we've just done a lot of that as a family. Well, I, 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 I can certainly say I'd rather, I'd probably rather be in, in the Bahamas right now than, although it's not bad for Wyoming in February, but uh, we've had about two weeks of 60-degree weather, and now it's uh, below freezing. So I, I wouldn't mind heading off to the Bahamas. But I, I just <laughs> I, I saw that in there, and I thought that was, that was, that was a pretty cool thing. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, Ambassador Francis Rooney, francisrooney.com is the website. Uh, you can find the book on Amazon and all the regular places. Uh, thank you so much for talking with us this morning, and hopefully we get a chance to talk to you again sometime soon. Well, Don, thank you for having me on. I'd love to. Thank you. It's, it's been our pleasure, and we'll see you soon. And there you go, Ambassador Francis Rooney, francisrooney.com. You can get the book there, The Global Vatican. Uh, that was a very interesting interview. It's uh, definitely uh, uh, something I hadn't thought of, and it's definitely some interesting stuff. Uh, on that note, we have to take a break. We'll be right back. News Talk 1270, KIML. Catch up on Gillette Wild Hockey News with Coach Winkler every Tuesday at 930. Don Carpenter on News Talk 1270, KIML. 